purposes. The harvest would be given to the king. But it was as the second harvest, the major harvest, was coming up that these locusts were sent. And in the vision, the land is stripped clean, causing widespread famine for the whole nation. Now, this can only be interpreted as the judgment of God. Uh, according to Deuteronomy in chapter 28, plagues of locusts are one of the curses that are threatened by the Lord if his people forsook him, if they uh, disobeyed him. But when Amos sees the vision, he cries out to the Lord for mercy. Sovereign Lord, forgive, he says. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. Now, the background is that Israel at this time was very proud. They thought themselves to be the foremost nation. They thought themselves almost indestructible. They thought that just because they were the Lord's people, every, whatever they did, it would be okay. But actually, Amos sees Israel as the nation really was, small and very vulnerable, and how easily the land could be wasted. And the second vision is similar in that the Lord again, in this vision, <clears throat> sends a devastating judgment upon the land. Verse 4. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. The Sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. Then I cried out, Sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen either, the Sovereign Lord said. Now, the second vision is, is similar to the first, in that the Lord sends in the vision a devastating judgment <coughs> upon the land. But if anything, the second vision is even worse than the first. It's difficult to say with any certainty what this judgment of fire means. Uh, some people think it refers to a terrible drought that would even dry up the underground streams uh, within Israel. Some people see it almost in terms of a, a nuclear holocaust. Uh, or some people see more of a supernatural element coming in after the natural judgment uh, of the locusts. But the important thing to notice is that this judgment is terrible. And it's from God. And the Lord will destroy the whole land. And again, the prophet cries out instinctively, Lord, I beg you, stop. Please, no. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. And in each case, we are told that the Lord relented. This will not happen, the sovereign Lord said. Now, the question is, how are we to understand that? How are we to understand the Lord relenting? I mean, is it a case that the Lord initially overreacts and uh, changes his mind? Does God suddenly, as it were, lose his temper with Israel and determine to do something that is out of proportion to what the nation deserves? And therefore, does Amos and his in intervention, does he sort of bring the Lord back to his senses? Is the Lord effectively saying, well, perhaps I was a bit hasty there, Amos. Thank you very much for making me reconsider. Yes, I will go for a change of plan, something that is more moderate and appropriate. Is that how we are to interpret these verses? The answer is quickly, he said, no. No. That's not how we are to understand the Lord relenting. It's maybe what you and I do when we relent. You know, we realize in relenting that there's a, a better way, a less severe course of action we could take. We reconsider. But that is never the case with God. <clears throat> the Lord never, as it were, makes a mistake. Never. The Lord never has to change his plans. They're always perfect. 
1 Samuel 15, 29 expressly tells us so. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind. For he is not a man that he should change his mind. 1 Samuel 15, 29. No, it's that when we read, read this phrase, the Lord relented, it's what the theologians call anthropo anthropomorphic language. It's when the Lord resorts to using human terms, human language, when he condescends to help us understand something that we can't really understand. He accommodates to our limited understanding. But really what we're being told here is that the Lord is essentially a Lord a God of mercy. His patience with us is very real. And very often, very often, he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Now actually it's very important for you and I to understand that these visions the Lord shows Amos describe what Israel truly deserves because of her sins. And if we can't see that, or if we won't accept that, then it's because we do not understand the seriousness of sin. We do not understand the holy character of God. It's because we trivialize sin, and we think it's no great shakes, no big deal. Ah, but these visions are reminding us that in fact sin is a big deal. Because these visions are describing what Israel deserves from God. Because of her many sins, Israel deserved to be destroyed. But repeatedly we are told in the scripture that the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve. He is patient with us. And he gives us time to repent. And for this, we ought to be very thankful. Now, actually, it reminds me and you that because I am not destroyed, you know, today I'm reasonably okay and healthy, because I'm not destroyed, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm safe. Nor does it necessarily mean that my life is pleasing in the Lord's sight. It may just mean that he's being very patient with me that he is waiting for me to repent before him. That's what it may mean. But it's also important for us to realize the place that human prayer has in God's dealings with people and humanity, because the actions of Amos here are really very significant. And, you know, we may ask the basic question, why the Lord gave Amos these visions in the first place? Why? Why did the Lord not simply carry out these visions and wipe out Israel without telling Amos or anyone else? Why did he not do that? And the answer must be that the Lord reveals to Amos the seriousness of Israel's sins so that Amos can pray so that Amos can intercede for the nation. So in effect, these, na these, these uh, visions are given as an invitation to Amos that he should pray to the Lord, come to the Lord in prayer. And it would seem that that is how the Lord chooses to work, at least in part, in response to yours and my prayers for people. There's a lot of mystery here, of course, but did we notice just how effective the prayers of Amos are? How many people prayed? One. Just one man. Just one man called Amos. How many words did he pray? Not a lot. were not sort of big prayers, were they? But notice how effective one man uttering a few words of prayer are. Notice, if you like, the power of prayer, <clears throat> the significance of prayer. Because many lives were spared. Many lives. Just because of the few words that Amos uttered to the Lord in prayer.
Now we've got other examples of this in scripture. If you, I'm not wanting you to shout out, but um, I wonder if you could give me some other examples of what of the same thing that happens when the Lord reveals to His servants the seriousness of something that's going to happen, and the servant cries out in prayer, and the Lord, as it were, relents. Let me give you two examples. <coughs> Genesis 18, where the Lord appears and he confides in his servant Abraham the seriousness of the activities in Sodom and Gomorrah. What does Abraham do? He prays. What does it achieve? Well, it achieves the salvation of some folk in these two cities before they're destroyed. Another example is Exodus 32, <clears throat> where the Lord reveals to his servant Moses the seriousness of his people's sins. This is after the golden calf incident. And the Lord's anger burns against Israel, and he speaks to Moses about this. And what does Moses do? He intercedes. And what happens? The Lord's judgment against Israel is tempered with mercy. Martin Luther once wrote, I love this quote, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. Prayer is laying hold of God's willingness. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. Prayer is laying hold of God's willingness. And the simple application for you and me <clears throat> is to remember the importance of prayer and, in fact, to remember the duty of prayer. Paul writes, and it's a very famous passage in 1 Timothy 2, he says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all goodness, godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So why are we being urged to pray? Well, so that governments will be helped by God, but also because the Lord wants, wants all men to be saved. That's why we pray. And through our prayers, God will hear our prayers and people will be saved. Evil shall be restrained and some will indeed, because of our prayers, be led to salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do you do when you receive information as you watch, and if you watch the news on television or how you receive your news, the question I'm asking is, what do you do with that information? You hear all the international news, you hear the national news. What are you doing with that information? Are we not to see these things as God's invitations to pray? Yes, the news will very often depress you. That's because it reminds you of man's depravity and man's sins. And yes, the Lord, uh, the news will remind you of the judgment that we deserve from God. But what are these camera shots telling us? What is the commentary doing? Is it not an invitation from the Lord to pray about these situations? Pray for the people involved that the Lord will show them mercy that he will not deal with people as their sins deserve. And some may be even led to salvation. The privilege of Amos was to approach the Sovereign Lord and pray on the nation's behalf. Ah, oh, but that's your privilege as well if you're a Christian. That's your privilege as well. And it's part of what it means to be a priest of God. <clears throat> Some people ask me, are you a priest? Then I say, no, 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 I'm not a priest. But of course, in one sense, I am a priest, and so are you. If you're a Christian, you're part of the priesthood of, of all believers. So Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5b, <clears throat> To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, 
and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. One of the responsibilities of the Old Testament priest was to pray. Pray for the people. And all Christians have this priestly privilege. Indeed, it's our duty. In the story of Samuel in the Old Testament, we read uh, this verse from the end of Samuel's life. 1 Samuel 12 and verse 23, very interesting verse. He says, As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. You see, it was his duty. It didn't matter if the people, what they were doing, they were doing their usual disobedience. Ah, but the, the, the duty of Samuel, he saw it to be to pray for the people. Well, it's your duty too, isn't it? If you're a Christian. Let's move on to consider secondly, finally in today's passage, verses 7 to 9, the God who says enough. So the God who relents. And then the second heading, the God who says enough. That's a borrowed title from a commentary that I use, I thought it was a very helpful title because I think that's actually what's behind what's being said in these final three verses. Yes, God is a God of mercy. Yes, he very often doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. Uh, but that doesn't mean he won't ever judge us, because he will. It doesn't mean that his patience with us will last indefinitely. Because there will come a time one day in the future where the Lord in effect says, enough, enough. And then he will act in judgment. Look please at verse 7. <clears throat> this is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Enimos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, Look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. <clears throat> the high places of Isaac will be destroyed, and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. So this is the third vision. And the third vision involves a plumb line. You know what that is. Traditionally, it's a, pe and a, a, you know, a weight and a piece of string, and it's held up, and it shows us where the true vertical is. I'm quite sure they've got some electronic gadgets these days that do it, but that's what the good old-fashioned plumb line was. And it would be used in the building trade where walls have to be vertically true, vertically straight. Now the cynic says at this point, well hang on a minute Mr. Preacher, this means that the intercession of Amos hasn't really achieved anything. Because in the end, uh, Israel will be judged. You know, the Lord says I will spare them no longer. And we don't read here of Amos crying out to the Lord in prayer on this occasion. It's all been in vain, you see. And I say, well, hang on a minute, Mr. Cynic. That's not true. Actually, the intercession of Amos has achieved much because the Lord's judgment here will not come in the form of total destruction as it was seen in the previous visions of locusts and fire because this time the judgment will be more selective. As someone says, and I quote, a plumb line is a somewhat refined and delicate instrument of judgment. Well, so it is. Indeed, the Lord tells us the places which will come under particular judgment and the people associated. These places and people are listed for us in verse 9. You see them? The high places of Isaac, the sanctuaries of Israel, and the house of Jeroboam. And that refers to the places, the centers 
of pagan religion, which had crept into the worship of Yahweh, and also it refers to the heart of corrupt government that belonged to King Jeroboam II. These places especially, and all the folk associated them, will be judged by the Lord. So the prayers of Amos did have, certainly did have, an effect. Anyway, we need to ask at some point, what does this vision stand for? You know, the plumb line. What does it stand for? What does the plumb line stand for? Every commentator has pretty much agreed that the plumb line stands for, what do you think? The word of God. The word of God, the revelation of the Lord that he'd given to his people that we call the Bible or the scriptures. Israel had been built by the Lord on the foundation of his word. God had given his word to his people from the very beginning. It revealed to his people how they should live, how they should view God, how they should relate to God. And it's according to that word that the people shall be judged. So if you like, the divine surveyor is going to one day return to his building. And he'll come to this wall and he'll hold up the plumb line against the wall and he'll see to what extent what has been built is in line with his word. And this will be true for everyone. There will come a time when the Lord says, you know, enough. Enough. And he measures us up against the plumb line of scripture. How have our lives lined up against the revelation God has given of himself in scripture? You know, the Lord's given us plenty of time to repent. So now there will come a time when he says, in effect, okay, that's it, enough. Now is the time to assess. Now is the time to judge the life of every individual. So here's the last question. At least I think it's the last one. That sort of encourages you to keep on listening. Um, what does the plan of scripture reveal about God? What does it tell us about God? What does the Bible tell us about God? Can I suggest a couple of things? The scriptures tell us, first of all, that God is holy. God is a holy God. And you see the holiness of God in various ways in the scripture. You certainly see it in the law, his law. We call it the moral law. And it's summarized in what we call the Ten Commandments. These laws, you see, were not just given to ancient Israel. These laws, the moral law, the Ten Commandments, was given to people everywhere in every age. So what does God require of us? Well, the first question is, what do the Ten Commandments say? You can find it, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. Number one, you shall not have any God besides the Lord. Because there is only one God. Number two, you shall not make for, you for, for yourself an idol in the form of anything on the earth or in the sky or in the waters below. Number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord. Because the Lord will not hold guiltless those who misuse his name. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and mother because, you know, treat them with respect. Number six, you shall not murder. And Jesus tells us and that includes murderous thoughts. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus tells us that includes adulterous thoughts. Number eight, you shall not steal. 
Number nine, you shall not lie and give false testimony against your neighbor. And number ten, you shall not covet. Whether it's your neighbor's house or his wife or his donkey or his ox or his Maserati. Anything that belongs to your neighbor, you do not covet. Now, all these laws are restated and expanded by the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. But this is a summary of the law which the Lord, who is holy, will hold up against your life and mine on the last day. Now, the question is, how will you and I measure up? Actually, I know the answer to that question. I don't need to ask you. Because the answer is, you won't do very well, and neither will I. Because your life is not as true to plumb line, straight vertical as it ought to be, actually by a long shock. We won't do very well. We've all sinned against the Lord. We've all failed him every day in so many ways. It would take a very long time to list all the things. So there's the first thing the Bible tells us about God, the holiness of God. But what's the second thing, broadly speaking, the Bible tells us about God? which we must never forget. You know, the Bible reveals that God is a God of perfect holiness, but the scriptures also reveal that he's a God of mercy. He's a God of mercy. Many examples in the scriptures of the Lord's mercy have just been reading my personal quiet time through the, uh, the, the, the life of Jacob again. Jacob the deceiver, Jacob the twister, how did God treat Jacob very mercifully, with great mercy, great patience? God also in the scripture shows mercy to, to whole nations, not just the nation of Israel. But what about his, um, the way he treated Nineveh in the days of, of Jonah? Jonah came and preached. Uh, the Ninevites repented. How did the Lord treat them? With great mercy. He didn't wipe them out. Then, of course, there's the mercy of God that's revealed to us in what we call the Old Testament sacrificial system, through its priests and its sacrifices, uh, through which the people could, in faith, approach God, maintaining their relationship with the Lord, knowing that through these sacrifices, their sins would be covered. The Lord is a God of mercy. So when the Lord holds against your life and mine the plumb line of his word on the last day, he will measure not only how much our lives have measured up to his holiness and his holy law, but he will also measure to what extent you and I have believed and responded to his offers of mercy in the scriptures. And all of these things reach their fulfillment in the life of our Lord Jesus. See in the life of Christ the goodness and the holiness of God. See it in his behavior. See it in the way that he never ever once ever sinned. There is the holiness of God. But also see in the life of the Lord Jesus the mercy of God. The mercy of God. See it there in the way that the Lord Jesus dealt with people patiently, kindly, mercifully, tenderly. But see it written there supremely in the account of the way that he died on the cross. He gave himself for sinners that through him we might be forgiven. See the mercy of God in the Lord Jesus as he died on the cross. You see, the plumb line of scripture will also reveal if you and I have re really believed, received the mercy of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, have you? What have you done with God's offer of forgiveness? Have you responded to God's pleadings for your soul? How have you responded to that? Have you come? Have you received his forgiveness and eternal life 
through the Lord Jesus. You see, all of us deserve the judgment. All of us deserve the fire and brimstone and the condemnation of God. We don't measure up at all to his holiness. We have not kept his laws. But the wonderful truth is that the plumb line of Scripture also reveals to us a Saviour. of God who sent his one and only son into the world that so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ let's pray Heavenly Father we thank you <clears throat> for these visions given to your servant and for his subsequent <clears throat> pleading with you and the way that you relented. And we thank you, Father, for your tender mercies that you do not treat us as our sins deserve, that you hear and answer prayer and that you use our prayers to exercise mercy and grant salvation on the earth. We pray, our God, that you will help us to devote ourselves to prayer once again. Thank you too for this third vision of the plumb line and we know Lord that one day the judgment of God shall indeed come and we know that he knows everything about our lives. We know Lord that we do not measure up to his holiness but how we thank you for that gracious revelation in the plumb line of scripture concerning the mercy of God not only in the Old Testament, but supremely in the New Testament, in the person and the life of our Lord Jesus, who died on the cross for sinners. How we pray, our God, that you will help us to believe this part of the revelation of Scripture and to come to Christ in repentance and faith so that we might know the mercy of God personally. We might know his smile, his hand, his warmth, his tenderness upon us, the gift of eternal life, the hope of heaven. And we thank you for these wonderful, wonderful things. Work in our hearts, Lord, today, that which is pleasing to you, that we may lay hold once again upon the Saviour and look at the Saviour and trust in the Saviour and cling to the Saviour. For what else can we do? Lord, hear our prayers, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.